Anyhow, there's a well-known story, famous story that most people are perfectly aware of, the story of uh, Rabbi Kiva. He was traveling along the road, decided he wanted to stop at a specific place, and uh, you know, he got there, he went to the Holiday Inn, they were book solid, went to the Days Inn, they were book solid. He was forced to go into a field with his rooster and his lamp and his donkey, right? What happens? Right? He says, Gamzela Tova, this is for the good. I'll be sleeping outside tonight under the stars. Somehow this must be for the good. And uh, as he settles himself in, lo and behold, the wind comes along and blows his candle out. So now he has no lamp and probably no matches and I guess maybe no stones to knock together. But he's out, a, he's out one lamp, basically. Gamzela Tova. A weasel comes along, I guess, taking advantage of the dark and eats his rooster. So now he has no alarm clock either. Right? To get up for Nate's the next morning. And he says, Gamzela Tova, as well. And somehow, at some point in time, a lion, apparently, according to the Gemara, comes along, right, and, uh, and eats his donkey. And he finds out, and he says, Gamzela Tova, right, sleeps the night, you know, somehow, some way, wakes up the next morning, he goes to the, to the, to the city to, I guess, to buy some food, whatever, and he notices that the inhabitants aren't there. What happened? In the middle of the night, certain bandits came and literally took away all the people from the, from the town, and they robbed the place, and, uh, and he says, he said, I told you, Gamzela Tova, if I had been accepted at one of these hotels over here and stayed in the town, I too would be, would be a hostage right now. If my light had not gone out, they would have seen it and come after me. If my rooster had crowed, they would have known I was there and taken me or killed me. If my donkey had brayed, they would have found the donkey, etc., etc. So therefore, Gamzela Tova, it's all for the good, right? Somewhat simplistic story. But we know that he learned this. I mean, he, he learned it anyhow. I mean, it would have been Rabbi Kiva's Midah, but he had a Rebbe for this. And his Rebbe was none other than, than, than Nachem Ish Gamzu. Nachem Ish Gamzu is the one who's famous for saying Gamzu Lutova, because he always said it, you know, because of Maisim. But what happened to him, he went to Rome to buy for the Caesar, and there was sand put in the box, as opposed to the jewels that were there, and you know, Gamzu Lutova, and it worked out for the best, and et cetera, et cetera. But the story that they don't tell very often, which I think is even more telling, more, more to the point, is the story that, um, that, that his Talmidim come, and they find him lying on his deathbed, basically, on a bed whose, whose legs are sitting in pails of water to act as moats, so the ants can't crawl up the legs to his body, because his body is totally ravaged, and he has no control over his limbs anymore. He's blind. Literally, he's in complete terrible shape. And as Talmudim come in, they say, Rebbe, Rebbe, to see you like this, it's terrible, we can't stand this. You know, you know what happened to you? you, know, you know, he says, oh, come to the top of this, you know, better you should see me like this now and see what it would look like in the future. In Alamaba. Why? Because one day I was traveling along the road and a certain Ani came up to me and said, Rebbe, Rebbe, now, you know, my furnace will tell you, know, give me some parnas, take some food, some anything. He said, no problem, just give me one second to, to dismount my donkey and I'll, I'll give you whatever I have, you know, and, and, you know, and he gets off his donkey, he looks behind him, and the guy's dead. He's lying on the ground. And he can't believe him. The, the couple of seconds he took extra to get off his donkey, as opposed to reaching to his pouch and giving him food, the guy dies. So he's so distraught by the entire thing, he puts himself on top of the man, eye to eye, face to face, and says, the eyes that did not have enough mercy on you, they should be you know, gouged out, and the, one, <coughs> the limbs that didn't respond to you, he curses every part of his body. The, all the curses come true. And he says, you know, this is much better. You know, Gamzu Lutov, this is much better. Because had this not happened to me in this lifetime here, just imagine what it would, have, would have happened to me, you know, in, in Olam Emes, in Gehenna, later on, because of my, my lack of responding on the spot a, a few seconds more he took in the end. Phenomenal story, phenomenal mida, to be able to say Gamzu Lutov in a situation like that. But there's even one more story. In some respects, even more is even more so this case, even more, you know, more than Rabbi Kiva's story, in some respects, even more than Nachmish Gamzu's story to, to some degree. But you really can't compare them anyhow, but it's along the same, the, the same lines. And that's the story of Rabbi Chinim and Tarajin, right? Basically, who is, you know, he's, he's been teaching Torah Barabi out in public. The Romans have forbidden it, but he's doing it anyhow. He's putting his life on the line. The Romans catch up to him. They take him. They wrap him in the safer Torah that he was teaching. They put wet sponges on his chest and they light him on fire because they want the wet sponge to slow down the flames or he'll die slowly as a message for all the Jews who might teach Torah Barabim or teach Torah Bechlal. 
And, you know, the executioner who's doing all this is standing there watching him burn and, and die. And his Talmidim and Bruriv comes up, you know, they, they see their, you know, she sees her father burning like this. She says, Abba, Abba, to see you burn like this is terrible, such a disastrous thing. You know, how can I, how can I be solved with this? How can I handle this? He says, not to worry, right? Not to worry. The same, you know, if it was only me burning here, maybe it'd be problematic. But since this is safer Torah burning with me as well, the same God who will avenge the disgrace <coughs> of the safer Torah will also avenge me as well. That's what he says. So don't worry. You know, Gams and the It's also going to work out perfectly fine here as well. As Talmudim say, Rebbe, Rebbe, you know, at least open your mouth and the fire goes into your mouth and consume you. He says, no, won't do that either. Because the same God who gave me my soul is the same God who will take my soul. I will not speed up and enhance the death process over here. And as Talmudim say, Rebbe, you know, what, you know, what do you see? What do you, you know, he says, I see parchment burning, but Osius flying up to Shemai. In the meantime, this story is like so compelling that the Roman executioner, who basically is like Mem Teshari Tuma of Mem Teshari Tuma, to be, a Roman, to be a Roman is one thing. To be a Roman executioner is like, you know, you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel over here, right, the bottom of the totem pole. And he's watching this whole thing takes place. And he's saying, he's saying to himself, he's like, like, what is going on? Like, who are these people? And, you know, how can they do this? And he, they're having a discussion as if they're sitting in the base measure someplace and having, you know, like a cup of coffee and, you know, discussing, you know, the, the Gemara and the Halacha and the implications. And the guy's putting to death. He's calmly having this whole discussion. And, you know, it is, either they're crazy, like really crazy, or there must be something about what they do that's so real that even in a situation like this, they can see past it and, and, and see the good in the situation. And it goes with the second one. And the executioner says to Rabbi Chinim and Taraj, I mean, these are, these are stories that have to be understood and analyzed because they're so powerful. We go right over them in the end. Yeah, and the executioner says, he says, Rebbe, you know, I'm impressed. You know, if I, if I take the sponges off your chest and allow you to burn faster, I can't save your life at this point in time, but I can certainly, you know, you know speed up the death and, and, and cause you less suffering. Do you promise me you'll take me to the world to come with you? He says, yeah, I make a deal. You can come to the world to come with me as well. And he does it, takes the, the sponges off the chest, he dies quicker, and then he jumps into the fire to join him as well, right? That's his, that's his, that's his you know, fast conversion process over here to Yiddish guy. And a, and a Bosco comes out and says that both, Re, both Rabbi Hanin Batarajan and the Roman executioner are muchen l'chaylamim. And I have read somewhere, I can't remember where, that the difference between Olam Abba and chaylamim, the, the expression the Gemara is, when a person is going to go to, to Olam Abba, he can still go through Gehenna. When the Gemara says you're muchel lechayl it means you, you don't you don't have to go through Gehenna even. You go right to the world to come. It says it by Rabbi Kiva when he's dying, right? <laughs> Another Misa, where basically they take him out because he was also caught teaching Torah, and, you know, and they take him out and they're like scraping, you know, pulling his skin off with with metal combs, and he's saying the Shema, and his Talmudim are going, you know, there must be a rule to all this. There must be like a limit to how far you go with this, like Mesir Nefesh business over here. Like, how can you say a thing like this? He says, hey, what are you talking about? All my life, I've been saying, with all my heart, I was able to do because it was most nefesh all my life, sacrificing myself to do mitzvahs, with my money, my possessions. Clearly, I put them on the line for the sake of serving God. But you know, And I ask myself, when will the day finally come I can show Kodesh Baruch and I'm prepared to give up my life to serve him. And here it is now, and I'm not going to take advantage of the situation? I mean, like, what kind of dialogues are these? Like, what's going on over here? The rest of the people are, like, screaming their heads off and, you know, save me, save me, mercy, mercy. You know? <coughs> and they're more interested in the halakhic you know, opportunity and the shkafic opportunity the situation is creating for them. Phenomenal. Where does that koyach come from? Where does that koyach come from? Like, what's the, what's the basis of this? So these parshiot, you know, that we that we're reading right now, last week, the one before that, this week, and one coming up, Mikates, basically, if anything is Maisa Ava similar banim, these are the ones. But Maisa Ava similar banim is not simply that the the Avas did things that we can learn from, meaning that you know, look, he, he did this, so we should do that too. He may, he sent gifts, we should send gifts. It's more than that. Maisa Ava similar banim means. That when they did something, it had such an impact on the spiritual reality of my separations, and particularly on the generations that came after them, that it changed our way of thinking. It imbued us with koyach. 
So when Avraham is makriv Yitzchak, or he basically goes to the motions of being makriv Yitzchak of the Akeda, so that gave that gave you know, you know, and all the descendants at, this after the koich to be able to give up their sons for the sake of a kodesh baruch to be you know she says to, she says you know you tell from Avinu to her last son right that that he sacrificed one son and I sacrificed seven sons over here right and I, and now me as well but the truth is the only reason why you could even sacrifice one son let alone seven sons was because Abraham was prepared to sacrifice Yitzchak he put the koich into the world. To make it possible that we can we can be most nefesh to that to, to such an extent. That's my sa'ava similar body. Right? Thank you. Right? That's really what it comes down to. That they did things that changed the messias of the Jewish people and reality, and they gave us the kayak to be able to do things that we take for granted. That's why, for example, we're often, you know, it works both ways. We're often confused because the, because the Gentile world Responds to things differently than we respond to. They either, you know, lack a certain perspective or a certain, you know, sense of restraint or a certain understanding, perspective, and we expect the world to have the same thing that we have. But the koiches that we have as a nation <coughs> are unique to us because they came to us from the avos. That's my avos and the body. So that's why Yaakov Avinu, when he's he's sending out the sheep, right, he's actually like you know making, um, uh, you know, telling them exactly how to deliver them, how much space to set between each of the flocks that were sent. So I heard this last week that, that uh, Ramosha Shapiro spoke about this. I think it's quite well known, but I, I never actually heard this before. That each one of these sheep, there were, there were 600,000 sheep that he had there. And that by giving over the Matanas, which included these sheep, he was actually giving over Jews to Asaph. He knew that historically, some Jews would have to go over to Asaph at some point in time historically. And Yaakov had no, he had no choice in the matter. And he was actually arranging, setting up exactly how it was going to happen. So that's why, for example, Asaph. If you spell it male, the way it's actually supposed to be spelled, which is which is ayin uh, sin yud vav, you rearrange the letters and you have the word yeshu, right? Yeshu, right? Which is yashka. That's the name that they call him, as well as as well as in last week's parsha, also yehush as well. Apparently, there's also a connection there too. So I mean, that's it's a it's a longer discussion, obviously, with a lot of a lot of implication. But the main point was was that it was mice of a similar body. When Yaakov did something, and Yitzchak and and Abraham. But specifically Yaakov, when he did something, he did it because he knew he was imbuing his descendants with certain koiches, for better, for worse, to allow us to be able to survive until the end of history. So, in last week's parsha, you know, he gets to the Yibok, and he crosses the Yibok after taking all his belongings over. He has a struggle with, struggle with the Malach, and the Malach basically, you know, doesn't want to, you know, bless him there or admit to the, the Baruch's belonging to him, but Yaakov forces the issue. And finally, the Malach says to Yaakov Avinu, he says, what's your name? He says, my name is Yaakov. He says, no longer will you be called Yaakov, but you'll be called Yisrael, right, from this point onward. Why? And the Torah tells you why. It gives you an expl- explanation why. im Elohim v'im That's what the Pasuk says. Because you struggled with a heavenly being, and you struggled with, with men, and you prevailed. And then he has the whole, you know, the whole struggle with, with, uh, with uh, Shechem after that, the whole episode. And then finally in Beit El, what happens in Beit El basically that that uh Baruch Hu, you know he Baruch Hu comes and he confirms the entire thing. He says two months ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the Rebbe's uh, meditating tonight, so we're having tea. Yeah, and, I understand. Uh, tea, and I know these guys like honey. What do you like? I'll give you tea. Uh, uh honey's fine, thank honey you. Yeah. And tea. I'm fine. Yes. No, no tea, plain tea, not even plain tea. No thanks. No, okay. So the uh. So if it's the Rebbe's your time, you can do a dash of whiskey. I don't have whiskey, but I have a. We have scotch. We got a scotch. Why don't you just bring the scotch over anyway? Oh, you know that. How about that? that it does. That, it does the same thing. That liqueur over there. This one is orange yeah. scotch. Okay. And tea. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. I have. If you want something, I have some schnapps. No, that's fine. Want schnapps? Do you like schnapps? I'm sorry. Let me do this. Well, I'm talking. I'm talking. <laughs> but yeah. So, so that's what happens. So, so the question, there's, there's a couple of questions that could be asked. Number one, first of all, when the Kodesh Baruch Hu gave the name change to Avram and Sarah, right, it was a one-shot deal. It happened at one time, right? No longer you called you know, of, of Ram, you're called Avraham. The Gemara says anybody who calls Avraham Avram or Sarah Sarai, as if that's their name anymore, they're over a, a positive mitzvah and a, and a mitzvah's losses and a negative mitzvah. Not by Yaakov Vinu. The, the Gemara does not explain why. Just the fact that Yaakov is interchanged with Israel with the Chumash, 
We just, that's the way it is. But there's no real explanation as to why that's the case. Second question, is actually the opposite of the way it should actually be. If we're saying that the whole, that the name of Yisrael is like a warrior name, it basically describes our struggles <laughs> and the victories that we had, so really, you know, who's more difficult to fight with? Obviously, the angel's more difficult to fight with. So if, if the angel is more difficult to fight with, than human beings, because an angel's got koich with kushbarach, and kushbarach wants the angel to win, the angel's going to win, and it will give him the koich to do so. So therefore, more logically, you should say, you, you fought with anashim, ki sirisi im anashim, ve im elohim v'tuchal. Because normally, you know, if you say, you, you, you fought with the, the, the bigger boxer, the stronger boxer, and by the way, you also beat the, the, the weaker boxer, there's no chiddush over here. Because you already know, if you can beat the bigger guy, right, then you can obviously beat the smaller guy too. But if you say you begin when you and you fight the smaller guy and then you fight the bigger guy, that makes more sense. Second of all, if as Rashi says, Anashim is referring to Asif and Lavan, it's also chronologically out of order. Because he met Asif and Lavan first and struck with him first, and then the next day he will meet Asif once again, but he's already had his fight with Asif. He's already had a struggle and with love and survived both. And the and the angel comes after the fact. So it should say Kisarisa im Anashim. V'im Elohim v'tuchal. That would be the more logical sequence of the pasuk itself. So the question is, you know, you know, are these real questions, or did something, you know, is, there, is, there, is what's going on over here a lot different? Thank you, right? A lot different than we actually think it is. So first of all, as we know, based on the struggles of the Jewish people, even this is a warrior name, Yisrael Kisarisim Elohim Elohim v'Anashim v'tuchal. Even though it's a name that describes a battle, the Jewish people are always fighting a spiritual battle not the, the physical battle. Any physical battle that we have to fight is always going to be the end result of a spiritual battle that we've lost. Every Galus and Geula always begins in the mind. It always begins in the spiritual plane first. The physical manifestation of either will always be the end result of a process, not the beginning of a process. So that's why the plagues last 12 months, because the Geula began with the first plague. <coughs> it only finally was actualized by the 10th plague, because that's how long it took to develop to the point to be able to go out. Likewise, the exile begins the way the same way as well. Begins with a few, you know, leniencies in halacha, and you can't even notice at the beginning the exile mentality. But it builds and it builds and it builds. So eventually, Kosh Baruch Hu says, "Time to leave the country. Time to go to Galus." At this point in time, but it was building for a period of time. So obviously, the struggle that Yaakov had and he continued to have was, was going to be a spiritual one. So then, what's the spiritual battle that he's fighting? What's what's the actual battle that he has to undergo? Right? What, what is the main struggle? I mean, obviously he's from, obviously he believes in Kush Baruch Hu. He's living by Torah. He's not going to abandon that. He's not going to, you know, turn his back on the Kush Baruch Hu. These people are solid in their beliefs. And then what's the battle he's actually fighting? There's only one battle that Claudius will actually fight, and the name actually implies this, and the entire story actually implies it. Where does the story actually imply it? Because basically what happens, he gets the Shechem. The last thing it says before he gets the Shechem is he arrives Shalem. He's an Adam Shalem. And the Rizal has a whole Rikas, what Shalem means over here. But Rashi explains it on a simple level. That he's Shalem Begufu, Shalem Amamono, Shalem Betor He's complete in his, his physical body. He was healed from the damage that the Sar Shal Esav did to him. He's complete in his, in his money. He's got all the money he needs. He's not, he doesn't have to go looking for any Parnas anymore. And he's even complete in his Torah. You know, in love and Garti, he knows all of his Torah. He's been learning. He's strong. He's a complete individual. He's reached pretty much the end of his line. He still has what to live at this point in time. But as Rashi says at the beginning of this week's Parsha, he meant to settle down. He's gone through all the struggles, right? Even, even Rocho, you know, has died. No, not yet. After, right? But, you know, but Binyamin's on the way. He's, he's got his 12th son on the way at this point in time. He's got the 11th Shvatim. Yosef is born. As far as Yaakov's concerned, it's like time basically to settle down and pass the mantle of leadership over to the next generation. That's the way he looks at it. He gets to a shechem, he, he mints some money, you know, and he, you know, and he makes, you know, he's prepared to settle down, buy a little land, there's Israel, he's back in there's Israel already. And then what happens, basically, is Dina goes out, right, and this whole episode with shechem, you know, occurs. Completely out <coughs> from left field, a complete shocker in every respect, in every sense of the term, shechem ben chamor means shechem, the son of a donkey, Right? This is literally the lowest you can get. I mean, this is, the Torah is telling you this guy is a real low life. Right? And it takes place with none other than Dina. 
right? And Dina, yeah, which we said before, Dina was supposed to have been Yosef, you know, because Lay was mispalel, tremendous mysterious nefesh, for the sake of for the sake of uh, of giving Rochel two boys as opposed to one boy. So this shouldn't have happened to her bechla whatsoever. This is totally again. I mean, where's the Kodesh Baruch in all of this, right? The whole thing is, is so completely against the grain and so undoing in terms of, you know, Hashkacha you Pratis, know, that Shimon and Levi feel compelled to actually go out and go to war and, and literally almost cause the destruction of the Jewish people because, as Rashi points out, the Amorim were prepared to attack because they thought this was the actual taking over of Eretz Israel. It was not the time. And what does Yaakov do? What's his response? He remains quiet. He remains silent. Not because he's speechless, but because there's nothing to say. There's nothing to do. What I, I could do what you did, right? And their response is, can we allow our sister, right, to, to be treated like a zona, like a like a woman of ill repute? And he's like, basically, what are you talking about? She's my daughter. And the exact same thing we see later on in Parsha's Parsha Shmini, same thing, is that Nadva Vihu, on the happiest day of all, of history almost, basically, the Chanukah a Mishkan of the Mizbeach, and it's the eighth day of the of the inauguration. And basically, the, the Kohanim were also being inaugurated, and Aaron's going to become, come, he's going to become Kohen Gadol, and the Shechid is coming down on top of this entire project, which is the, the greatest time of success you can possibly imagine. It's like the highlight of the Jewish journey in the Midbar to this point. And not the Navi who go out, and they do this terrible act, and they, and as a result of that, they get you know, two lightning bolts basically come up in the, in the Kodesh Kodeshim, they burn out the, the, the Neshamas of not the Navi who, and they die. Right? And Moshe, as if to console Aaron, comes over and says to him, you know, this is what a Kodesh Baruch Hu had told me way back in you know, Shmo somewhere, right? that on the day of the inauguration, he's going to be sanctified through his great ones. And I thought that meant you and I, because you know, we're, the old, we're the elders and we're the, we're the leaders, and I thought you know, we were the, you know, the greatest of, 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 the, of everybody, not because of, of a guy, but just in terms of Torah knowledge and you know, yichas and all that. But now I see that not the and the who are greater than you and I in the end. I mean, they made a mistake and it's tragic, but they must have been great people because otherwise there wouldn't be a Kiddush Hashem in the end. The Yidom are, and he's quiet. Doesn't say anything. Right, and Rashi points out, because of this, he's rewarded for his silence in the end. Because sometimes silence is a bigger Kiddush Hashem than acting out. Sometimes not responding is a much greater revelation of one's belief in the Shkacha Pratis than actually going and responding to the situation and taking things into your own hands like Shimon and Levi do in the end. So what does Yaakov do? Nothing, really. There's not, you know, what would have Yaakov done? Nothing, really, basically. They might have made the agreement, they might have done bris mila, they probably would have moved on, but it was not a time to take revenge against the people of Shechem, especially since Shechem points out they're shlaming, these people are honest. Once again, the Jewish people are being forced in a position to do things exactly the opposite of what integrity seems to dictate. And how we seem to be known, and you know, it just you know, as, as as Yaakov says, like you 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 you've muddied our name, you've made us you know look so bad in the eyes of the rest of the world. And he comes out of this thing intact, <coughs> right? And he says, "What? What's his response to this? Basically, gums of the tova. This has to be for the good too. Somehow, to to whatever, and I can't imagine." You know what? There must be a din involved, as Rashi points out. He put din into the box to hide dinner from from Asa because he thought that maybe you know he would take her. But Rashi says you know maybe we should he would have chuva because of dina. Hard to imagine dina having the koyach to be able to be machzir Asa but chuva. But you never know. Rashi says it. You have to assume there must have been some possibility. And and, and Yaakov should have been willing to take that chance apparently. But whatever the situation. Whatever the din, somehow there must have been some good in the entire thing. So what does so what does Yaakov do? Right? What is what does what Yaakov you know? You know what, what comes out of the entire thing in the end? So it turns out that there was good in all of that, and that is as Rizal as Rizal points out, there was an atzotz kadosh from Adam Arishon that somehow had made it through the generations into Shechem. It was there for a period of time. It had to be redeemed. By somebody who could do it and yet somehow survive the entire incident and not be absorbed by the people of Shechem or the or the Kananim. Right? With some of the with a tremendous quake to be able to go out but come back as well. And who could do that? Someone who is almost Yosef, who's also he's, he's, he's Yatsa Amitzrayim, that's Din in the end. 
And from that, the Nitzotz comes out of Shechem, Dina comes back into the fold again, she marries Shimon later on, right? She goes back, and, and what, happens, what happens to this little Nitzotz? It gets born in the form of a little girl. They have a child. Shechem and Dina have a, ba- have a baby girl, but they reject it. The Yaakov's family rejects this child because it's born from Shechem, it's born from a, a bad situation. And according to the Medrash, she even put a little necklace around this baby and left it like you know, you know, in the open, saying that anybody who marries this child is not from the, the family of Yaakov. It's not, you know, can't be from the family of Yaakov in the end. And if, according to the Medrash, a mother takes this child down to Mitzrayim somehow, you know, I guess maybe someone found it, whatever the case, but it was arranged that the child should go down to Mitzrayim, Potiphar adopts this child, raises the child like his own daughter, when the time comes to marry her off, she marries none other than Yosef himself. And from Yosef and Asnas, the daughter of Shechem and Dina, comes a friend and Manasha, who every Friday night we bless our children to be like. The symbol of perfect, you know, you know perfect chinuch in the end, of, of, of people who could survive in galas and maintain themselves and never lose perspective of who they are and where they came from in this entire episode, because it's mitzvot. And it's no different in a sense what the Alshik says about what happened in Stom, right? Avraham would not go down to Stom, but he knew there was the mitzvot of David and Melech, somehow he was aware of it, it was time to come out from amongst the klipus, from amongst the, the tumah. Stom was the place of impurity at that time. And Avram was looking at Stom saying, how do I get in there? How do I redeem the spark? What am I supposed to do? And Lot comes along and says, you know what? We can't get along anymore over here, so how about I move on to someplace else? I was thinking about Stom. What about, what about Stom? And Avram says, nothing. But not any place but Stom. I mean, that, you know, Mr. King himself, he's like bringing people back to the way of God, and his own nephew wants to go out and become you know, a Stom like me. And I was like, no, don't go there. He doesn't say anything. Because Abraham knew this must be Hishkoch Pratis. Mm. And Lot goes down there, and he marries a woman from Stom, and has four daughters. Two get married to men, stay behind Stom, get destroyed when the city is destroyed. Two go out with their father and mother. The mother becomes a pillar of salt along the way. I mean, look at that Hishkoch Pratis, right? Because if she survived, obviously, what would have happened would have happened in the end. And she becomes a pillar of salt, and they go into the cave, and the daughters think there's no one else around for them to marry and have children from. They give birth to children, which basically becomes Moab, and eventually from Moab comes Eglon, from Eglon comes Rus, and from Rus basically comes, you know, marries Boaz and becomes, you know, you know, open and all these, you know, in Yishai and eventually David and Melech. The path of an Itzotz, a, a, a holy Itzotz from the Klippas out into the open. Gamzula Tova. It's all for the good. All is part of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's master plan. Whatever happens, and that's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu split up the naming of, of Yaakov. Before Shechem and after Shechem. Because there's always two parts to a transformation in the person. There's the intellectual and there's the emotional. Right? Lots of people walk around with a lot of hashkafa. Lots of people can sit here in a sheer, a sheer you know, situation and discuss ideas and say, yeah, it's all Mishamayim. Does God in the world? Absolutely. Did he make my separations? Absolutely. Does he sustain it? Absolutely. Is everything Hashkach HaPratis? For sure. Is it all for good? 100%. And the guy will go out to catch a bus, and the bus will get there three seconds before he does and take off. There's not one for another half an hour. He gets all frustrated. All frustrated. I gave the shoe last night, you know, and it didn't work out in the computer. And I came home, and I'm going, I can't believe it. I can't believe that this didn't work out. Why didn't it work out? I didn't, you know, you know. And then, in the meantime, all the words go, Gamzala Tova, Gamzala Tova. The whole shit is about Gamzala Tova, you know. And I'm struggling to say, you know, Gamzala Tova, in the end, because it's difficult. Because intellectually, you can be macabre in two seconds if it makes perfect sense. But emotionally, it's a whole different struggle. So when the, the angel names Yaakov in advance of Shechem, he's talking on the intellectual level. Yechak, you get it? This is who you are. He even, he even gives a hint to what's coming up by putting Anashim second. Because to fight with an angel, piece of cake. It's easy. Why? An angel works for God directly. You know, maybe angels work part time, you know, they moonlight and do stuff on their own too. It's possible, but not usually. If an angel confronts you along the way, it's because the Kodesh <coughs> has sent that angel to fight you, to battle you, right? So you're battling with the angel. You can't say, gee, I wonder if this is Hashkach Pratis, and I wonder if this is all for the good. Because, yeah, this is exactly what it is. 
to fight with a Yaakov, to, with, with a Lavan, <coughs> and an Ace was also not as difficult, hashkafically, and hashkafically. Why? Because Yaakov knew who he was dealing with. He knew who Esav was. He knew what was at stake. He goes to Lavan, he knew who he was dealing with. Rachel says, my father's a real trickster. Yaakov says, I'm ready for that. I can be a trickster too. I was trained back home by my mother, took the brooks from my father. Don't worry, I can match him. Yaakov understood when he fought, when he fought Esav and fought Lavan that this is historical. There's a major ramifications and, impl and implications of these battles. When you know that you're about to have a major battle, you prepare yourself. You're, you gird your intellectual loins, so to speak. You prepare yourself for what's coming up. And therefore you're ready. But you come to Shechem, a place where basically it's like Hefker. And this whole Hefker incident takes place by a guy who's not even on your grid. He's not even on the map, right? No one even talks about this. But who, who's the Shechem bin Hamor? Before we got here, who even knew about this guy? And this guy, I mean, Esav wasn't able to touch Leah, wasn't able to touch Rachel, wasn't able to touch Billah or Zilpah or any of the daughters born with, you know, with the, with the Shvat team. He touched nobody because he, he tried to bite Yaakov's neck. His teeth fell up because his neck turned to, to Shayish again, right? Lavin, <coughs> Lavin says, you know, I wanted to. I couldn't. It all belongs to me. Couldn't touch anybody. And Shechem ben Chamor goes ahead when they're all settling down. It's nice and quiet. And takes Dina and he forces his way with her. This terrible episode takes place, and yeah, that's enough to make a person go crazy. So certainly to, to fetch and to complain and say, Where is God? I mean, like, you know, I fought with the angel, I you know, in love and God, I did all these wonderful things. I came to the you know, to Shechem, Shalem with all these fantastic successes behind me, you know, and this is the way God thanks me. This is the way God rewards me. What are you, are you kidding? This is terrible. Where's God when you need him? So Shimon and Levi say, okay, whatever, but we're going to go out and take revenge. And Yankov says, no, this, this, there's got to be some good in all this. There must be, you know, I can't see how this is, how, how this is holy or how this is like important or where this came from, but i got to tell you, if it happened and it happened to me <coughs> and it happened to my family, it must be Hashkech Pratis, it must be for the good. That was the emotional absorption of the idea of Kitsarisa im Elohim im Anashim v'tuchal. And then Akash Bochum comes back and Bedel and says, ah, now we can finish the process of naming you. Because by Abraham, it wasn't a question of intellectually and emotionally absorbing the hay, or by Sarai. They already were what they were. It was mostly really confirming the, their, their status in the eyes of the world. But by Yaakov Avinu, there was a transformation. He was crossing the book. He was becoming an Ish Shalem, an Adam Shalem over here. And that transformation had to be passed down through all the generations. There's only one problem, though. Even though he was successful, as we see what comes up after that, he was successful, the rest of the Shvatim were not, because first of all, 11 were already born, and the 12 was on his way. Whatever Yaakov accomplished, when Avraham had his name changed, Yitzchak wasn't born yet. When Sarah had her name changed, the same thing. Yitzchak wasn't born, so whatever transformation they went through was able to be given over to their son, and their son's sons, and all the generations after that. But Yaakov went through his transformation late in life, after everybody was born doing their own thing already. And Binyamin was about to be born, so whatever hashpa, right, was limited. So therefore, the Gemara says, and that's why Yaakov and Yisrael are interchangeable. Because even though Yaakov himself became Yisrael, he was able to overcome and get to the, the, the Metzias of Gavim Zalotov, which means two things. Gavim Zalotov means everything is a pratis, and everything is for the good. It all is part of the master plan. A holocaust, the crusades, the torture, obviously the happy stuff, the good stuff, it's all, you know, it's all for sure, right? But all of it is not one aspect. And the Leshem says that's really what the Shema is teaching us. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad is exactly this. What do, you, what do you have to tell me? Are we talking to, to people who don't believe in Torah? It doesn't make a difference to them. You have to know that here Israel, that's why it says Yisrael, not supposed to Yaakov. Here Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What is that supposed to be? Hashem Elokein. We end off saying Hashem Elokein. Seven times. Why? Because intellectually, we've been able to achieve it through Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But Sukkot is the time to integrate it. Sukkot is the time to actually become a Yisrael. And that's why Sukkot corresponds to Yaakov Avinu. Right? Pesach corresponds to Abraham. Shavuos corresponds to Yitzchak. Right? And, and although some change it around, but, but, but for the most part, Yaakov is the one to whom Sukkot corresponds because that's the time you finally integrate the concept of Hashem Elohim. You actually are able to get the level of kisarisa im Elohim v'im anashim v'tuchal. You actually emotionally, emotionally integrate the message of the Shema and the name Yisrael itself. 
And that's really what has to happen. That's what's going on now. Now the story goes from Yaakov to the Shvat. The Shvat are now going to integrate this, and that's what Yosef is able to do. Because as Rashi points out this week's Parsha, that when Yosef goes down to Shechem, I mean, of all the places to go, it was just about, you know, 17 years, you know, how many years earlier? It was 17, 6, it was like 11 years earlier, this whole episode happened in Shechem where they destroyed the place, and now they're, they're tending their sheep, grazing the sheep by Shechem over here. And Rashi says it's bad news. It's bad news because Shechem is a makam, that's muchan, the poryanot. It's a place of bad news because that's where Dina was violated, that's where Yosef is going to be sold, and that's where the Shvatim later on will divide between the you know, base David, between you know, the kingdom of, of, of Israel and the kingdom of Yehuda. That's the place of Shechem itself. That's what takes place over there. But look what happens. Dina is violated. Because she's violent, the process, okay, it's not a chachil, it's not the best way, but we're living in times of galus. We're living in chutz ganetin. Things go backwards. Mimers of tachbol, it's all part of the same idea. Right? From this interaction with Shechem, Asnos is born, she marries Yosef, and Ephraim and Manasseh are born from that. Right? That's a tova, that's a silver lining, this gray cloud. Because Yosef is sold, he's sold in Shechem, a terrible thing. <laughs> terrible thing. Right? And, and they're kidnapped, and they're chayiv misa, and all these different things, but because he was sold in Shechem, <coughs> he was sold to Midyanim, the Yishmalim, down to Mitzrayim, where he was, he was able to fill, fulfill his destiny as a world leader. His dreams became fulfilled because he was sold in Shechem. Gamzu Tova. But to hang in there, right? To wait till the Tova actually comes, right? That's what Shemenes Koyach. That's what Yaakov was trying to instill. That's what the name Israel means. To, be a, to, to get to a point, and even though it sounds kind of like Pasha, very, very, very simple, you see, it's not true, Bechlal. You watch people in life. You watch the way they behave in shuls. You watch the way they behave in the makola. You watch the way they behave in situations that are difficult. People are not real with the concept of gums of the tova. And you can't really get to the, to the level of completion of shleimus until you do, because that's what it means to be Israel. A Israel is somebody who's able to be holding the level where gums of the tova is real to them, not only intellectually, but emotionally as well. That's the transformation. And that's what you have this whole story with Yosef coming up, you know, this week's Parsha. What's going on? You just look at the whole thing. And as Rashi points out, you know, by Yosef himself, right? What happens? And that Yosef is he's doing well for himself. He's already out of jail. Actually, he wasn't in jail yet. He was he was bought by Potiphar. He's master of over his master's house. He's running everything except for his you know, master's wife, right? And he's curling his hair and he's treating himself like a melech. So Gushbar who says, he <coughs> says, your father's in mourning, and this is this is what you do. This is the way, you know, this is how you, you live your life. I'll sit the bear on you over here, right? But again, it's like, it sounds like an onish, but because this whole thing happens, what happens, right? Because had, it, had this, not, this episode not taken place, Yosef may only have remained head of Potiphar's house. But because the wife goes after him and he rejects her, he becomes Zerchi to become a leader. He goes to jail because of it, because he's in jail. He becomes famous because of his you know, interpretation of dreams. Because of his interpretation of dreams, Pyro pulls him out later on and he becomes viceroy of Egypt. And that's why it's always working out, right? I mean, when the the most classic cases, I mean, this, again, it's a very hard thing to say because people are very sensitive, but you cannot, you can't deny the historical reality, and that is basically that the Holocaust resulted in the founding of the state of Eretz Israel. Obviously, people don't hold that's very important, but reality is, is that here we are today, the Jewish people are in the land, it's developed, it's built up, we not only have survived, we have thrived. Now, the, the truth is, we'd be much better, obviously, not to have paid that price. If we had been asked by God, you can have the land, at the cost of six million lives, we wouldn't have taken the deal, obviously. You know, who would have, even for a couple of lives, who would take the deal? Because, you know, we value the life of every single Jew, and who's to decide who lives and who dies in the end? Because makes the chishbonus. And historically, much more active, we can look back and say, well, that's clearly what happened. That was the threshold to get to this point over here. Right? So everything, by definition, has to work out in the end. And even though we can't always see it, and it's not necessarily in our lifetime, it's going to take place, but that's, that's the driving belief of the Yisrael. And as long as a person is working on that, he's doing Yavodah Hashem. The learning, the Gemara, right, the Halacha, the Hashkafa, the Musr, it all fits into this. If a person is not using all of that, and, and on top of that, of course, life experiences, if a person is not using all of that to get to the point where he can be emotionally connected and real with Gams of the Tova, that no matter what happens, the course of his life, and he can just basically say it with a full heart and realize that every situation, as bad as it is, it's not a question about it could be always worse. It's not a question about being worse. It's a question of that somehow, as bad as it is, as it is right now, somehow the concluding story of this, because I'm a Jew, 
because I'm part of Klai Yisrael, has to have a positive event. The way I would write that positive event, not necessarily. But when it's all said and done, you must have and we're looking back at the entire situation, will also be musky. It was all for the good in the end. And that's what Yaakov was able to instill in the Jewish people, at least to some degree, by the whole episode of what last week was coming up this week's part, because also the same thing as well. He's a suffering still goes on, as Rashi points out. He went to settle down. He wasn't able to settle down because Yosef was taken. The whole thing happened all, all, all over again. He wasn't able to stop his mourning. But again, because of this entire thing, the family is saved. Yaakov is reunited with Yosef once again later on. Everybody lives happily ever after, you know, at some point in time, except for the brothers because they're still floundering, trying to, you know, figure out what went wrong and how they missed the point. And that's why, as the, as, the, as the Gemara points out, Yaakov is still a name to be used because of the fact that the Jewish people have not yet absorbed the lesson and will be able to absorb the lesson until you must have Mashiach, which is why the Malbim points out that the real battle comes down at, at the end of history of Ashkachik battle. And it's not against the Gentiles per se necessarily, but rather the Sheba will come to an end, he says, and the Jewish people have a choice. And the Jewish people divide the two sections, what they call the Yaakov part, which is, is Hamona Am, it's the majority of the people, he actually calls it the, less, the, the lesser element, but he goes, the majority of people will choose to stay in the diaspora, choose to take up positions among the Gentiles and say, after all these years of suffering, after all these years of having to pay the price of being Jewish, we're finally being respected and given the opportunity to work and to make money and have leadership positions. This, this is like Gula, right? This, you know, this is worth staying around for and, and living through. And a small contingent, which he calls the, <coughs> the, you know, the, the, the Israel component, they will say, no, this is not where it's at. This is only part of the, you know, part of the, the plan. It's a stepping stone. They will be the ones who will turn to, return to Israel and will not accept anything less than the return of the nation back to the land, the building of the base of Mikdash, the Shekinah returning to the, to the base of Mikdash, and then their schus, the schus of the Israel component of Kalei Israel, Mashiach will finally come and end everything, basically, and show how the Kishboch was behind everything. It was all for the good.